Hello everyone, welcome to Flag Growth. I'm Jake Pelly, and today is October 11th, two th or sorry, October 10th, 2019. I was looking at the time, the same time I was looking at the date. As always, here's our fun disclaimer. This has been recorded, you can always view it at your leisure once I post the replay. Also, today's quote is from Paul Volcker. When people been, begin anticipating inflation, it doesn't do you any good anymore. Because any benefit of inflation comes from the fact that you do better than you thought you, you were going to do. Now, why did I bring Paul Volcker back into today? Well, that's pretty simple. Today, the Federal Reserve confirmed the new rules for the Volcker Rule. Basically, the Volcker Rule is set into place so banks don't speculate on money too much. And it was kind of a loose guideline rule where there was a lot of gray areas in it. And Congress passed it to kind of clarify some of those gray areas where banks can and cannot invest in. And that is usually a pretty good thing for investment banks and banking in general. And if we go take a look today at our heat map, you can see that banks received that pretty well today. <clears throat> particularly the financials and the big banks. Now, I'm going to cough a lot today, so you're going to hear the, the sound drop off for a moment or two as I hit the mute button. There is a pretty big fire up in Yosemite, and all that smoke just settles here in the Central Valley, so it's going to be affecting my voice a little bit. So just bear with me. It's going to get a little bit hazy here. But... You know, smoke is better than not having power like a lot of people in the Bay Area right now, so I, I guess I can't complain too much. So today's list is going to be the SBY, the IWM, the QQQs, JP Morgan, XLF, which is the financial ETF, USO, UNG, TLT, GLD, GDX, UUP, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Cisco, uh, McDonald's, Shopify, uh, NOW, Netflix, and AMD. When I was writing this list, I was looking at Netflix, and I was like, eh, maybe I'm not going to put that on my list today. Maybe not. It was right there on the fringe, and then someone recommended it. So it looks like I should have added it to the list today. Hopefully everyone can hear me sound uh, loud and clear. Now, looking at the market here, the Dow Jones is up 0.66%. The NASDAQ is up 0.58%, and the S&P 500 is up 0.73%. If you watched my market recap yesterday, you'll know that the markets had a pretty d ugly downturn last night. The futures were down over 1% on pretty much every index. And then during the early hours this morning, we got a reversal that trade talks are progressing in the hopes of a mini deal with China. Now, something I also wanted to point out here, they're going to talk about, okay, there's a mini deal with China. You know, they're going to buy U.S. Ag, and we're going to allow some of their companies to buy some of our products here with some exceptions. And before I went to bed last night, I clipped the Reuters top headline here just to show you actually who is the biggest one to think about that is the reason why the deal is progressing. And if you can point it out here, you're a pretty smart human being. If you can't, don't worry about it. There's two companies that made this top five of Reuters, and that would be Yahweh. Yahweh. U.S. to issue licenses for supply of non-sensitive goods to Yahweh. China urges U.S. to halt pressure on Chinese companies, including Yahweh. This trade deal is all about Yahweh and what they can get and not, uh, what they can finally get a conclusion on in that company. It's the biggest telecom inside of China and any type of trade deal is going to have to include that company. That is the sticking point for China is Yahweh. So when you see uh, issuing license for supplies for Yahweh, bullish for the market. That means the trade deal is most likely going to have some progression there. If you see that Yahweh is getting blacklisted and cut out of markets, it's going to be most likely bad for the trade deal and most likely to fall apart. That is the most important thing to kind of watch there when it comes to trade deal talks is Yahweh. That is the hardball stance China has. And any type of trade deal is going to have to include this company. It's almost non-negotiable. 
Either you allow Yahweh to buy goods in the United States, or we walk from the table. And you can see that calmer heads did prevail, and some exceptions happened for Yahweh, and the market reversed. Now, yesterday in the market recap, I talked about the minor trade delegations fell apart, or they didn't really compress, but today is really the big deal for the trade deal, talks. And any type of good news we see during the night is going to reverse that market really quickly. And surprise, surprise, they reversed the market, went back up. Now, what sectors will do particularly well if we get a trade deal? Well, that will be your semiconductor sectors. Those ones will most likely catch a nice little bit higher. And you can see today it's a little bit mixed on the news that they're meeting today. And any type of deal that happens, even if it's a mini deal, might bode well for semiconductors. Now, if the trade deals completely fall apart, it's going to be pretty bearish for the semiconductor sectors, particularly, particularly for the, the small to mid-cap semiconductor sector. So keep that in mind. So that's what you want to continue to keep a watch on for this market is the trade talks. Now, also this week, we had more economic news that was just as important as the trade talks. Well, Jake, what can be as important as trade talks? Well, we had Federal Reserve minutes where they talked about doing QE, not QE, and continuing with the repo action. And the need to... a the need to make a repo bank, which they've tried before in the, in the past and just really can never get the votes to actually pass it and make it for the repo action bank. And talking about potentially doing a little bit of a repurchasing of bonds or a inflation of their balance sheet, which means they're going to be buying bonds here, which is uh, last time I checked when the Federal Reserve starts adding to their balance sheet, that's called quantitative easing when they do it in stride when they start doing a lot so but they're not going to call it quantitative easing this time they're going to call it non non qe so just keep that in mind so you can see pal spoke three times this week it's been a pretty volatile week just for news wise the market seems to be doing all right considering all about the news and then going into next week what type of news do we have well next week is when the um, repo action was supposed to end but the fed extended it out to november and then we are going to be moving into the start of big earnings next week. So you want to keep that, uh, you want to keep a watch on that going into next week for the market. Now we also have housing starts, jobless claims, and industrial production. Industrial production will be uh, watched pretty heavily with the poor ISM manufacturing number. Retail sales will be eh. Retail seems to be doing okay-ish. So you're going to want to watch industrial productions and the start of earnings. And then two weeks from now, we pretty much have every big FANG company is going to be reporting. I do believe Microsoft, not Microsoft, um, Netflix is also starting to report earnings, I think, next week. Yeah, it's the 15th. That's the 15th or the 16th. So... If you're trading Netflix here and you're trading long-term options or long-term holds in your position, you do want to be uh, careful going into next week there. Netflix gets pretty volatile towards its earnings, so keep that in mind. Nice. Yeah, I'm in the in the boat of until this week's over. I'm kind of uh, waiting in this market. It it's too it's too frothy for my tastes. And you see here, the SPX is diving. All right, so let's go take a look at the SPX real quick. Now this is the E minis. This is the mini futures on the SP the uh, S and P five hundred. Ooh, and it is diving. Look at that. That's a pretty ugly candlestick. It did look like it found a little bit of support, though. Again, today is train negotiation day, so you're going to see lots of news of, oh, they, they fell apart, they broke for lunch, angry. And it's going to send the market down. Or Trump tweeted about delegation not going good, or delegation going great, and it's going to send the market, too. So today's going to be a little bit frothy, so... If you are trading this market, um, be prepared for some pretty volatile moves towards the end of the day, too. 
I wouldn't be too surprised if we get another whipsaw in some capacity, either back to the upside or right back down below. So um, the targets for the S&P 500 are going to be wonky at best just because of today's a big market moving event. You know, it's interesting though that we have this market moving event and it hasn't concluded yet. So we can look at our ranges going into tomorrow and determine, okay, that was a nice area of support. That's a nice area of resistance. We have a nice opportunity to kind of chart out where we'd like an entry or exit price today before the event concludes. But we also have the unfortunate action of talking about a market that's potentially going to move very volatilely towards the end of the day once trade talks conclude. So do keep that in mind. If I give you any numbers in the S&P 500, um, <clears throat> these are loose numbers at best just because today's a red star event or today is a market moving event that will potentially move the markets really volatilely towards the end of the day depending on what happens with the trade talks. If they get pushed over tomorrow, tomorrow's the day you want to watch. <clears throat> so you do want to keep a watch for that tonight. Now, I can give you some ranges to look at for the S&P 500. And the ranges right now look to be about 293.50. And Pierre was kind enough to say that these lines get really thick sometimes. So we're going to go talk about right here. And we're going to add right there. 293.50 is our upper target. And right here, we're going to move that right there. And right there is our lower target, about 288. By the way, it was very nice meeting Pierre if you're here. Right there. Here we go. So that's the ranges that the S&P 500 seem to be in right now. You can see the last couple days they've tried to go up above it and come back down. And the midpoint would put us right around right, okay, right here, right here. <clears throat> that would be about the midpoint of that range, about 290.50 right there. Once I put that back in there. By the way, I enjoyed meeting all of you during this, uh, last week it was a pleasure to have make your acquaintance it was nice to finally see the faces to the people making these posts i had a great time um, i've been on dad duties non-stop since then i finally got to meet swalik i got to meet nick and i've met micah before got to meet his family what a bunch of cool people and i enjoyed all your questions and your insights that you gave me during during this week or last weekend it was really an amazing time I hope all of you had a great time as well. Um, I wish it would have went a little bit longer. I do long to be in the presence of other smart traders. Here in Fresno, I am pretty much by myself trading. And so being in a room full of professional level traders was pretty much like Christmas for me. I mean, I never get to talk options with other traders. And it, it was just a pleasure to, to talk to all of you. <clears throat> and Lisa, uh, I think it's... Lisa 747, sorry Lisa if I get it wrong, had such an amazing story of how she day trades. Pretty eye-opening. With that being said though, let's get back to the S&P 500. So these are the ranges I'd keep a watch on. If it does break above the 2950, you're looking at a potential return right back there to the 20... Right there, give me my line right there. To about the 28. Let's see if T will give me it. So that's where you want to keep a watch right there for the upper ranges. If the 288 breaks, you're going to keep a watch right here. Right back to the 28, uh, the 23. So let's go text. Sorry about that. So these are the ranges I'm currently looking at for the S&P 500. If it breaks down, I'm looking for the 20, um, the 20, 283 be the next target. If it breaks up here, I'm looking at the 293.50, then a return right there to the two, sorry, right there, the 299, or potentially even to the 300. So those are the ranges I'm currently looking at for the S&P 500 for movement. Okay, Andy's talking about his uh, 
has stopped. Very cool. And going back to the S&P 500, let's go take a look at a two-minute chart here. Let's go see. Um, it's looking... Man, that two-minute chart is wonky. That is a wonky setup. It looks like it's trying to recover back into this 200... 2,937 range, um, but yeah, that's that's Chop City right there in the ES. Looking at the implied volatility for the S&P 500, it's not going to actually give it to me because this is the SPX. Uh, that's the ES. Uh, we're currently sitting right there at 17%. The average for the year, it's getting a little bit high there. Looking at the VIX overall. Once it loads up for me, uh, the the VIX is going all over the place today. Had a nice little gap up in the end of the close, and then a nice decline here. Once this trade war event ends, trade talks ends, the VIX is either going to have a nice follow up movement back to the 18, or it's just going to collapse back down to the potentially 14. I don't see the VIX moving below 12 here. Just because earnings are around the corner, and because earnings are around the corner, usually be, uh, traders have a lot of protection placed on the market. So, most likely the VIX 12, 14 level is going to be sustained here. Unless earnings come out very spectacular and there's just great news across the market, most likely volatility is going to stick around for a little bit longer here for the VIX. So just keep that in mind. Alrighty, next up, let's go take a look at the IWM. Now, if you are a risk-on trader and you have a high risk tolerance, way higher than mine, um, you might consider putting on a trade on the IWM. But if you have a moderate risk tolerance or even not that risk or very risk adverse like I am, I would kind of avoid the IWM here for the next couple days. The IWM is going to be all sorts of crazy just because of trade talks. It's going to be very volatile here. Um, for now, I'm not even going to give targets on the IWM until trade talks conclude. Just be careful on it. Just be very, very careful. If you're going to be longing the IWM here, I highly recommend a put, a long put for protection, just in case it falls through. I'm not saying you have to buy one, but if you're looking to long the IWM here um, today, that's a lot of risk that you're currently putting on this index. This index, more than the other three indexes, is going to have a lot of movement here the next couple days. Now, with the clarification of the Volcker Rule, it is going to help a lot of small cap banks allocate money to investing. And that is good for its financial sector. And if we go look right here, and I did show it earlier, if you're wondering why the financial sector looks so strong in the Russell today, it's because of the clarification of Volcker rules. And for those who don't know who Volcker is, Paul Volcker was the Federal Reserve Chief during Jimmy Carter's time. You know, not a lot of people like Jimmy Carter's presidency. And I'm not going to talk about politics and the whole situation during his presidency, but he has, without a doubt, been the greatest post-electoral president in our history. Just the stuff that he does for humanity ever since he left the presidency is breathtaking. He is a national treasure when it comes to what he does for humanity. Jimmy Carter, my hat's off to you. What a great human being. I mean, he fell, broke his hip had terminal cancer, beat the terminal cancer, went back to building houses for Habitat Humanity. He is killing a, he's helping eradicate a parasitic worm in this world that there's no known cure for it. There's only treatment of symptoms for it. And since he is um, crusade and getting rid of it, it's gone down. Infections by the, I think it's a guinea worm, has gone down like 90% of a parasitic worm that really has no benefit to society whatsoever. I mean, Jimmy Carter, man, what a great post-president human being. So, Volcker was the president during his time, or not the president, the Federal Reserve Chief, and 
he didn't pass the vocal rule. It was passed in his name. So when you get clarifications on what banks can and can't invest in, usually it's pretty good for the banking sector. Now, if they would have said, okay, banks, you can't do this, and it was a big bread and butter part of the banking, well, that would be bad for the market. But just clarifications of where they can potentially put their money now for trading, it's going to help small cap banks quite considerably. He is the real deal. He is the real deal. I think it's the... Um, let me get it right. Yeah, here it is right here. Guinea worm eradication program. Can become the second human disease in history after smallpox be eradicated. It's the it will be the first parasitic disease to be eradicated, and it's the first disease to be eradicated without the use of vaccine or medicine. How crazy is that? So my hats off to you, Mister Mister President. Going on here. Let's go take a look at our, our financials. Now, I did talk about the Volcker Rule in length today, but the one stock that I am interested in looking at is JP Morgan and XLF. Now, if you want to continue trading the banking stocks, there's a whole bunch that you can currently look at. We're going to cover one of the largest cap banking stocks, and we're going to look at XLF. And then from there, we're going to look at our commodities, and then we're going to do our fan favorite stocks. Those are the stocks you requested today. So, looking at JP Morgan here, JP Morgan is at a nice little range here. It's been really struggling to move right above this 115 for quite some time. 115 and save here and line right about the uh, the 112. Looks about let's get this a little bit better, a little tighter in that range. Looks about um, 11170 looks to be the next target there in that range. So there we go. So those are our ranges that JP Morgan are currently in. All right, let's go line. There we go. There we go. So we're looking at either a movement above the 115 to return right back down to the 11750 or a move back down to the 1150 here and moving lower. Now, if we do violate this trend and we do move lower, it looks like right here at the 11050 is the next stopping area. And um, JP Morgan has earnings very soon here. You can see that they have earnings. Uh, where's our earnings calendar here? Yes, Thinkorswim used to have it, but because I'm using the um, paper trading one, paper trading doesn't have earnings dates on it. And you can see right there, look at that movement down in the last two minutes. Absolutely getting hammered here. There's its earnings date. Okay, it does have it. It's 10:15. So if you're going to be training the bank stocks, understand that they're going to be reporting before the market on the 15th. The banks typically like to report on the market before the market opens because they got business they have to do, and better just to get those out of the way so they can re resume their business. So J.P. Morgan, um, Citigroup, usually reports hand in hand. And then um, Bank of America will be the lagger. So Bank of America, if it comes out on the 15th, typically Bank of America will come out two days later. So it will usually come out like on the Thursday or usually the Monday. So keep that in mind. If you are trading bank stocks here, next week is earnings. So just keep a watch to the range. And if the range brings to the upside, you do have a nice little channel for some profitability to the upside. If it does break down, do keep a watch on that. Volatility is going to stay relatively stable until that earnings of it next week. So volatility is most likely going to stick around for a little bit. So what does that tell us? That tells us that there is some option ability in the options to extract it. Now you're not going to want to be 
and options um, past earnings because earnings are very volatile in bank stocks right now because of uncertainty. So if you are going to be playing the options, you're going to be you want to be out of them before the 15th here or before their earnings date. Now, there's a little bit of option premium we can extract here. I like the 16th, the 13th, uh, 16 delta, the 30 delta, uh, 13th delta. There is a little bit of option premium extract there before the earnings event, but remember, earnings next week, earnings will disrupt a channel greatly, or it has the potential to gr disrupt this channel. So what you think might be a, a nice secured put here might go against you relatively quickly if you're in this trade past earnings. So do be careful here if you are going to be trading the bank stocks. They're going to start reporting next week here. And they usually report pretty close to on top of each other. The one bank stock I'm really interested to watch is um, Goldman. I do think this one's going to be particularly volatile. So I would definitely avoid that one if you can. If you are trading Goldman Sachs here, I'd be very careful. And you can see they're going to be on the 15th as well. That's probably going to be the most risk on sector in the financial sector. That's going to be the most risk on stock inside the financial sector is this one right here. So I would be very careful if you are trading long Goldman into this earnings. Um, with the banks having clarification on what they can and can't invest, banking might be a little bit stronger here though. After its earnings, I would get consider it keeping a watch on the whole sector. Okay, talking about books. Very good. Now, and is anyone actually trading any financial stock right now? Do they have any long-term holdings in financial stocks? Are you looking at, looking at Wells Fargo now that they do have a CEO? Do you, are you holding Bank of America? It'll be interesting to see what you have to say. Now, say you don't want to pay the individual financials and you want to play them whole as a sector. You can look at the uh, ETF or the XLF, but understand that the XLF... Go right here. Has a lot of exposure to Berkshire Hathaway. Let's go show you right here. And Berkshire Hathaway is more of a insurance, a conglomerate of financial companies. And you can see right there, its top holdings are Berkshire Hathaway at thirteen percent. So. Berkshire does take up a big percentage of its holdings, and that's Warren Buffett's company. So, um, if you are going to be trading the XLF, you have a lot of exposure to that that stock, more so than the other big financial sectors inside the United States. You have more exposure than you do for the J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, American Express. So, if you are going to be trading the XLF, just keep that in mind. It doesn't really trade the top banking sector it trades Berkshire Hathaway is the number one holder and if we go look at the heat map in the S&P 500 um, last time I checked Berkshire Hathaway is a big component of it as well you can see BRK slash B and you might be saying Jake why is it slash B well it's because there's B shares and A shares there's BR slash A and BR slash B and there's even a BRK slash C so and if you have enough money to um own one share of the A-class Berkshire Hathaway stock, uh, we should talk <laughs> because it's currently like $300,000 for one share. So do keep a watch on that one. Berkshire Hathaway will have the most beta weighting when it comes to that movement for the financials. And again, the range is pretty tight for XLF as well. XLF also pays a dividend, just like JP Morgan. So knowing that we have a lot of earnings coming out next week for financial companies, um, it could potentially rock XLF quite considerably. You know, if JP Morgan reports good earnings, but Berkshire Hathaway and Citigroup don't report good earnings, it's going to potentially tank this ETF. But outside of earnings, if you do want to play the banking sector without pay playing the individual banks you can definitely take a look at this one now with that being said because earnings is upon us once again that right here implied volatility is most likely going to stay elevated 
until next week is over. So again, there is some volatility to extract here. Be very careful of this range though. This is almost looks like a, an inverse bull, uh, bearish pennant, almost. So you do wanna be careful in that, that range right there for XLF. It could be a potentially nice downward movement here if it does reject this 2150 and it does move lower. It could be a nice setup for an interesting short, particularly if the banks are showing weakness across the board. Now, if the bank shows strength, most likely we'll see a nice return to the 2840. Next up, let's go take a look at our commodities. Now, is there any questions so far, questions, comments, concerns? Always feel free to ask anything in the chat room. And don't worry, we will be getting to our fan favorites here shortly. Now, looking at USO here, oils once again collapsed pretty much lower. I expected the movement back down in oil. You know, oil is not doing very well. The ISM showed that we are contracting in the manufacturing sector. And the ISM, the manufacturing sector, has been showing a pretty much a recession in the United States for the past like six months. So when manufacturing starts slowing down, it does tell us that these companies are using less oil to produce goods. And that is kind of bearish for our products. Now, across the board, if we do start seeing a global recession, if the economy start contracting and we do see... Um, Recession of GDP, people buying less products, it's going to be bearish for this commodity too. So when you enter into a global recession, typically oil gets hit pretty hard because people are buying less goods, traveling less. That means they're using less oil, buying less goods, which a lot of products are made from polymers, which are derived from oil. So most likely it's going to continue to see a lower range here in the commodity. So if you're looking to long oil here, um, range wise it's a pretty tight range I'm not seeing any upside potential until we either a get a huge disruption in the Middle East or B we get a good GD GDP print in both those cases oil might see a little nice little uptick as it is right now weekly range is 120 down to the one to the 1080 if it does break above there you are looking at return to the 1150 and I don't see much upside potential right now to see oil above 12 once again. So it does look like it is still printing lower highs and it's consolidating. So once again, you're waiting for the consolidation to break and then trade the appropriate range. But right now, you're looking at cents. You're not even looking at dollar movements here. I mean, 11.20, the 10.80. You're not even looking at a dollar potential range here. So oil's pretty much as dead money as you can get trade range wise just for the uso um, looking at volume volume is pretty anemic the histogram of macd is upward trending so it is a nice potential upward movement here in the histogram but the moving averages are still pretty wide and they're pretty bearish now stochastics is oversold so we might see a nice little bump there for oil and return to the 1150 eia petroleum status came out this week and it wasn't that bad here it is right here once it loads up, you can see that we had a, a, a slight buildup in oil reserves. But again, anything below 5 million is, is pretty much a static number. But we did have a nice drawdown in distilleries. So distilleries are your polymer-based products, your plastics, your clothing, anything that uses oil in its base to make its product. So it has been drawing down for the past couple weeks, which is a pretty good deal. Um, anything below or above 2 million barrels is usually considered a pretty good number for distilleries. And you can see that there has been a, a nice significant drawdown. Now, it could be that companies are, are getting ready for the holiday season and they're buying a lot of products to get ahead of that. So you do want to keep that in mind when it comes to distilleries. We are entering pretty much the Christmas season here. Yeah, I know Halloween hasn't even passed yet, but Walmart, Lowe's, and Home Depot, and Target already have Christmas stuff out. So, um, just consider Thanksgiving gone. It's been merged with, um, it's been bypassed. So, companies might be potentially buying more products to get ready for that. Now, you can see if that is the case by looking at in, um, inventories. 
product inventories and that does come out as part of the GDP as well so if product inventories are building up usually that's a positive for GDP and where is that again inventories came out I believe so last week no I don't see inventories here so do keep a watch on that one but again oil looks like it might break out here Ooh, actually oil looks pretty good here what happened in oil all of a sudden Let's go look at a two-minute chart of the light sweet crude. Actually, oil looks kind of strong. Oh, look at that. Breakout in oil. Interesting. Oh, we're having a pretty strong move right now. Okay. Let's go take a look at the dollar. No, I'm going to look at the dollar. Here we go, DXY. Oh, the dollar's down significantly too. Okay. Oh, the dollar's spiking. Oh, that's weird. Usually you don't see the dollar starting to move up here and oil moving up too. That's kind of odd. Yeah, oil could get back into this 1150 range. I think that's pretty overextended for the oil market right now. But the range does support it. So keep a watch for a potential breakout here. Again, when you see consolidation, you trade the appropriate ranges. If it breaks up out of consolidation, you follow the upward range. If it does break down, you follow that appropriate range too. And if oil breaks down here, you can see right there, it's held that area of support, that 1060 for a quite considerable amount of time this year. Pretty much for the length of this year, it's held that 1060. There has been a time where it has broken down and when it has broken down, it's moved all the way down to 923. If oil gets to 923, I would consider longing it. Remember, oil is a commodity that's used, and that looks to be a pretty attractive area right there. You can see every time it gets about to that 923, that 9 level, it does see a nice little upward bounce from there. If we go look at a weekly chart in oil, let me go extend it out here. You can see right there about that. Ooh, 8 even looks pretty good here. But every time it gets around 9, it usually catches a little bit of a bid. So keep that in mind for oil. Next up, let's go take a look at UNG. Now, also, oil is going to have a little bit of volatility here. Volatility is not particularly great in oil. But it is right there midpoint. So you're looking at like 40% implied volatility. But again, when you're looking at USO... You're looking at cent movements. You're not even looking at dollar movements. I mean, look right at the money for the next month options. You're looking at 41 cents, 36 cents, 30, 50, uh, 59 cents. So you're not looking at huge amounts of premium here. Now, relative to the price of the stock, that's okay premium. But relative to movement in price of delta, um, that's not, not too significant. So you have to put on a lot of contracts to potentially uh, beat the cost of commissions. And yes, there are still option commissions on Thinkorswim. So not particularly great. I mean, 10 even. You might probably get a 13 on oil for a cash secured put. But that, you're going to be holding it for 36 days there. So not too particularly great for oil. Now next up, let's go take a look at UNG. Now UNG did have its inventory report here today. And you can see, surprise, surprise, it built up once again. Um, really, the inventory report doesn't have that much of an impact on natural gas. Just because there's so much of it that some companies still just burn it off. They just burn it off when they tap a mine because they can't uh, capture it, compress it, and transport it. So they'll just burn it off in the atmosphere. So when you look at the, EI, the, nat the natural gas inventories... They really don't move the inventories. Uh, the, they don't move natural gas that much. So looking at as a trade wise, let's go take a look at a daily on natural gas here. Let's go take a look. How am I doing in time? Oh, doing great in time. Still downward range here. Still looks like natural gas is moving down in the downward channel. Right around here. See if they're still talking about a book. Okay, still talking about a book there. So 
Natural gas looks like it's in the downward range. It looks like it did find support at the 19. If the 19 is pierced below, you're looking at potential return to the 18. Um, histogram of the MACD is all sorts of wonky. Volume is not too bad. Um, volume actually picked up, and you do want to see volume picking up as you test an area of support. If volume does pick up the if volume starts to escalate as you're testing a major area of support, there's a high probability of it piercing below. So keep a watch on volume here. We might see a nice little downtick in UNG. Option-wise, UNG is currently well elevated. Wow. Um, UNG actually looks like it's at a... The last couple months, it's been slowly just creeping up in implied volatility. Okay. That looks pretty good. Um, let's go take a look at its options then. This is 30 days out here. I want to be like 22 days out in natural gas. So, let's see. How are you currently trading UNG, uh, Bob B? Let's go take a look here. Let's go to um, open interest and volume. Let's go take a look at the at the money. 36 day out front month option expiration. Let's go take a look at our open interest and volume. Our open interest is pretty uh, it looks like there's a lot more open interest in our call our puts than our calls all right um volume looks pretty much spot on between the two at one 1651 and 15 so volume looks pretty preferable uh, there's no real call to put volume there that you can kind of get see the discrepancy it does look like the open interest is being carried a lot more heavier in the the, the put side so it does look like someone's expecting a potential bounce, or at least hoping to bounce for uh, in UNG. Look at these options right there. It does look like right there, um, someone put a big, well, that's a huge position right there at the, the 21. So what I'm looking at right now is the open interest. These are options currently open on the front month out options at the 37. Uh, the 21, there's 37,000 contracts. Wow. That is huge open interest. I think that actually dwarfs any other. Yeah, that's interesting on the UNG. Right there. What is going on with the 21? Someone is betting that it will not see a 21 in, in the next 36 days. That's a big open interest there. Now, 37,000 contracts relative to some of your trades like Apple or the VIX is not that huge but when you're looking at an individual option chain on a company or an ETF you have to consider the volume around it and look at this volume I mean if we were to add all the strikes available to us together it doesn't even come close to this 21 right here not even not even potentially a third of what this is. Someone is betting large on UNG, not going back to 21. That's pretty interesting. Waiting for a good setup to enter seasonality in, okay. Got a seasonality tool. Yeah, it looks like the past 10 years. One, two, three, four, five. Hmm. One, two, three, four, five. The past 10 years have been bullish. And one, two, three, four, five have been bearish. The last five years, though, have been pretty good. If we just use the last five years seasonality, it looks like November is a pretty good. Um, it looks like no November is pretty good for the past five years. And then... In December, it looks like it has a pretty ugly couple months. Hmm, that's interesting. I just don't like the um, option chain right there. Someone's betting large that it won't get back to the 21 here. 
A 21 would put us right about here. So, um, yeah, if it does recover, it does have a potential recover right here to the 20 even. And then it, even a nice little breakout at the 1950 might be a nice little range there. Uh, just be careful there. There's someone in the options that's betting large right there against the 21s. That is a large position too. So just keep that in mind for UNG. If it does, does find support here uh, at the 19, it looks like right here at the 1970 looks to be the next stopping area for potential upward movement for UNG. They stepped up drilling, so lots and lots of supply. For those who don't know, the, nat uh, the United States is the world's largest producer of natural gas. So we have a glut of it here in the United States. We have so much natural gas. Uh, for natural gas energy production, you can get an, a natural gas generator to make a power plant brought into a, power, uh, brought into a facility on the back of a truck. Now, it's a big diesel truck, but natural gas uh, power production is pretty cheap and profitable. So, just because the commodity is so cheap, the thing with natural gas to consider is it's really, the thing to consider with natural gas is it's difficult to transport because you have to transport it in pressurized vessels and pressurized uh, pipelines because it's a gas you have to liquefy it and then transport it that way or you have to have a continuous flow so uh, that is something to look at um, a big industry that's growing right now is the liquefied natural gas transporters Pierre is actually a pretty good um, a pretty good resource on this he enlightened me that some rigs that are currently being set up, they'll have the pressurization plants right on site when they, they cap a new well for it. So they can do that all right there. So, interesting. And I do thank Pierre for that insight right there. Very interesting. Yeah, I would keep a watch on the range here. Someone's betting large against the 21 not recaptured for UNG. <laughs> Below there is an abyss. Well, yeah, let's see what happens if it drops here. Let's go to a weekly. If it drops below this uh, 18, it looks like the next stopping area looks to be about 1750. Uh, from a monthly scope, it's looking pretty ugly on the monthly charts. There's the monthly charts. Yeah, the monthlies haven't been there in quite some time. Interesting. Fascinating. Next up, let's go take a look at bonds. Now, we're going to look at bonds, and then we'll get to everyone else's stock here because I'm probably way over in time for where I should be. So, yesterday at the market recap, we looked at TLT, and we did talk about a potential breakdown right there at the 14-day moving average right around the 141.70s, and if it does break down, you're looking at a return right down to the 138.80s. So if bonds do continue to correct lower, keep a watch right there for the 138s. And then from there, completion in this range would be about the 136s. So if it does move lower. Now if we do get a recovery in bonds, it looks like 140, uh, 146 does look to be the upside of this range. We are sitting right there on the 14-day moving averages, so we're right at the midpoint of that range already. If it does break higher here, you're only looking at a potentially $2 more raise here for bonds. Now, why would bonds continue to move kind of wonkily or sideways for the next couple weeks? It's because of earnings. Bonds are going to be a little bit wonky here for a week or two and then once the earning events are over, once the big cap market caps re report their earnings and if they're positive, you might see a flight out of bonds into um, dividend Large growth dividend players like your Apples and your Microsofts might catch a bid after they report their earnings. So keep in mind, for the next two weeks, bonds most likely are going to be a little bit volatile here. We have a Federal Reserve talking about not wanting to cut interest rates again. 
but talking about we will if we have to, and we will be accommodative to liquidity in the market, i.e. buying or repurchasing bonds and allocating to their balance sheet. When the, the Federal Reserve steps in and they start buying assets, they're going to deflate the interest rates on bonds, or to put it another way, they are going to make bond yields move lower. Because when a buyer steps in and buys large quantities of your debt, you have to pay them less of a yield. So bonds might get a little bit of wonkiness there. Though, when you have reduced yield, typically your bond prices move up. So it could be a nice little pop for bonds there. We are living in a world where there's a lot of negative interest rates going on and there's a lot of arbitrage between buying those negative interest rates bonds and having the countries that's doing so going by United States treasuries that are yielding positive. So like your German bond that's yielding negative returns, Germany will take that surplus of money and go buy a yielding bond in the United States and so they win in both sides and the, our Federal Reserve doesn't like that. It doesn't like that the ECB or the ECU is going and printing out money. Their countries are taking that money, paying less back on their bonds, and buying our bonds that are returning to yield. We don't like that we're losing out in that war. Though we do like people buying our debt, but unlike Germany, who's paying less back on their debt, we actually have to pay more because of the yielding of our return, of our bonds. So... It, most likely bond yields are still going to be kind of weak here for the next foreseeable future. If a recession is upon us and we keep seeing weak ISM manufacturing, because remember that ISM manufacturing was abysmal, that showed contraction in the space, and if those continued, if we continue to see numbers like that, the Fed is going to step in and they're going to cut interest rates too. So typically that's good for the price of bonds here, but we'll have to wait and see for the next couple weeks for TLT. Uh, had to sell some oil, but I bought it pricey. Okay. You bought you bought oil here. Fascinating. Uh, let's go take a look at oil one more time. I am an oil trader, so I'm gonna loop back on this quite. I'm gonna loop back on oil a lot. It's still breaking out here. Okay. Well, if it continues to break out here. I keep a watch for the 1121 on the intraday. Uh, 1128 looks a little bit better. So right there would be about your ranges to watch on oil. If you're going to leg in the oil here, um, look at the 1121 and then the 1128 because you can see there has been a rejection of that 1128 pretty heavily this week. And let's go to like a 30, let's go a one hour chart. And then from there, um, right that 1145 looks to be the next upward area for oil, or at least USO. But with that being said, let's go take a look at these fan favorites. And so the fan favorites today were um, Shopify, NOW, Netflix, and AMD. So first up, let's go take a look at Shopify. So... Shopify's earnings. Let's see here. Report on 8.1. Oh, my warm water and warm tea has turned cold. Let's see here. On June. Looks like it's in earnings or December. And it looks like it had earnings on in September. Okay. So Shopify had earnings, it looks like, in September. Let's go to a daily range. <clears throat> uh, no, it had on August. So every three months. So August, September, November. August, September, November, December. So it looks like December might be the next earnings date. Um, range wise 
volume is or volatility is pretty high in Shopify. Earnings looks good. Earnings were oh a big beat here. And earnings were a beat. So earnings are still looking pretty solid on Shopify. Uh, it does look like it is in an upper range here. Not bad. Uh, not bad for Shopify. Let's go check out to see the fundamentals of it. See if it has gotten any better. Uh, high forward PE ratio. That's interesting. <coughs> so... We don't have a year of er positive earnings. Is that true? Let's go see here. We have. Uh, we don't have a year of positive. Er we don't have the year. Waiting for our last years of earnings here. Uh, actually, looks like it should have a a good PE ratio. It's not. That's interesting. Wonder why it's not showing up here. Let's go actually look at the PE ratio here. Oh, negative 466. So that's a <clears throat> that company is growing. Let's see. Shopify is just a um, digital storefront. It makes 1.3 billion dollars in sales. It doesn't make an income. It looks like a lot of it, income is going towards growth. Let's see here. Book per share is pretty okay. It's well above that. It doesn't pay a dividend. Uh, employees are good. <laughs> Free cash flow. Uh, it looks like it's putting a lot of its money towards growth there. <clears throat> so, book sales is a little bit high. And short float is, okay, short float's fine. Any insider selling? Nope. Any type of big upgrades or downgrades today? Nope. Okay. Here it is right there. October 29th, so its earnings are going to be next, uh, are going to be this month, at the end of this month. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, so Shopify has earnings here in 19 days. Does it follow implied volatility waves here? Let's go take a look on a daily range. Uh, it does definitely wash out on implied volatility. The answer is not really. So if you're going to be trading Shopify, you have 19 days till its earnings. Implied volatility is relatively high. So we're going to look at like our November or back options, or at least I am. Um, let's go take a look here. Let's go back to just our Greeks. Um, okay, like the 250s. Not bad. Studies. Here. Probability of expiring cone. There we go. Also, when I do this paper trading platform as opposed to my live trading one, uh, you can see how I put on all these um, indi indicators. So, looking at the range of, let's edit this study. 100 period range. We're going to look at the uh, three, two standard deviation, so that, that puts us at, I believe, 95. Oh, Windows. Yep. Okay, so I guess we're stuck at the two standard deviation. Hmm, 267s. And 385s. Okay, so looking at this option chain, 385s puts us well within the the 52-week high here. So we're going to be looking at above that, like the 423s. So 267s is where we're looking at for potential cash secured put. Uh, you can get you can get some premium at the 240s. The open interest there, though. Um, open interest at the 250s, 240s. Not a lot of liquidity there, though. Hmm. So 250s, 
255s, puts us a little too much margin. Hmm. Okay. Let's go look at the put side. Ooh, the call side. Look at that. 415s. It's like a 415 250. That's interesting. Get about a dollar there. Okay. So there is part there is volume to extract here, volatility to extract here in Shopify. Just because it's so close to its earnings, its earnings are 19 days out. Um, range wise, looking at the range here in Shopify. Are you currently long it? Are you short it? Are you looking to enter the stock here? Um, the past week it's had a hard time crossing above the 30 uh, 329. And it's looking like right there, if we go really tight, the 310s or 311s look to be where it is finding some support here. You can see a lot of chop in this area. If it does break down, it looks like typically the 300s followed by the 290s would be the range to look at to the downside. To the upside, if it does cross above 328, you're looking at it return right back down to the bottom right there at the 336s and the 351s. For a potential upside movement in Shopify. The histogram, the MACD is not helping us. The movement averages aren't helping us. The cat sticks are telling us we're right in midpoint. <clears throat> Hack and ashy charts. Uh, first green candlestick, but again, what is its average range in its movements here? So that's something you want to look at for um, Shopify. It looks like it's pretty much sticks here it's moving between that's 326 and this 310 range <laughs> thank goodness for zero commissions well it's zero commissions on stock trading it's not zero commissions on option trading on thinkorswim they still charge you 65 cents in option contract. Um, looking to enter, but IV is so high on Shopify. Yeah, it's pretty high here. Uh, and it's not looking like it's going to go away going into earnings. Give me my uh, implied volatility. There it is. Infall right there. Yeah, usually before it's earnings, we don't usually see that big of a significant drop down it usually sustains the earnings that movement there so if you're gonna be buying options on Shopify for the next 19 days understand you're gonna be buying a lot of Vega or a lot of option premium there so if it does by chance uh, move lower you're gonna lose out on a lot of Vega now Vega on the at the money 36 day out options right now you're looking at like a 41 cent movement then again and they're $22. That's $2,250 from one contract. So every time uh, Vega moves 1%, you're looking at either an increase or decrease of $0.41. Cents. So you do want to keep that in mind on uh, Shopify. Yes, volatility is relatively high here. And those are the ranges I look at for a potential breakout. Um, because it's the paper trading account, Let's go take a look at, hmm, if I want to do a spread on Shopify, I definitely want to be out before it's earning, so that would put us about a 15 right there. So, what we're going to do here is we're going to create an alert. We're going to wait for it to be above 329 or above. And we're going to look, create an alert right here, um, right there, at or below, well, let's go with 311. And then once that's triggered, that's the position I'm going to be looking to take. So if it breaks to the upside, I'll look for my potential um, long calls or short puts. And if it breaks to the downside, I'll do the inverse trade there. So maybe my uh, credit my bull my bear credit spread my bear call credit spread or look for a long put there <clears throat> so I'll look for that trade for Shopify 
Um, I'm going to set up an alert and wait for either the breakup or the breakdown in this range, and then that's when I'll qualify into that trade. <clears throat> Next up, let's go take a look at now. N O W. N O W. All right, what is this company? Service Now. Uh, it barely makes an income from its sales. But you know, um, making some income is better than no income. Its book per share is $6. 75 cents. We're currently at $262, so I would say it's a little inflated. Its P.E. ratio is 17,468. You know, I'm not a math mathematician, but I'm going to say that's a pretty high P.E. ratio comparatively to the sector. Let's go see. You never know. Comparable to the sector, it might be low. Okay. It has the highest P.E. ratio of its sector that you can currently see. So, um, there's that. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, that's a... Wow. That's a huge P.E. ratio for its sector. Matter of fact, it's the highest. Uh, its forward P.E. ratio is not too bad, though. It's 61. So that means I might be getting a bad data feed there, if that's the case. Let's go take a look here. Okay, positive earnings, positive earnings, positive earnings, positive earnings. Let's go take a historical look at its earnings. So its earnings are positive. You're paying a high premium, though, <laughs> for a $300 share company that only reports a uh, 71 cents in earnings. That's how you can tell you're having a bad data feed right there, by the way. I'm not paying $17,000 in P.E. ratio for this company. That's a little absurd. That forward P.E. ratio looks to be a little bit more right. So, you do want to keep that in mind. It does look like it has a lot of debt. Um, so, I would be careful there. Short, short range, not too bad doesn't pay a dividend no notable upgrades or downgrades uh, we do have insider selling but again not massive insider selling so okay what does this company do okay uh, it looks like it's just a IT flow employee workflow so it looks like it's a digital office space yeah it looks like it's just a digital office space order flow company so uh, it does look like it's absolutely gone higher this year. Looking at its range, it has a nice range here. You can see it, it has a nice little area of resistance right there at the 280. Oh, right there. About the 272 uh, midpoint of the 14-day moving averages. We're sitting right on it right here. And the low point looks to be right there at the 284s. So let's go um, 272. Two sixty and right there two forty six. And there we go. So these are our ranges we're looking at right here. So not a bad little range it's forming though. I mean not bad for covered calls. Volume is absolutely cratering, so that's not great. Um, Stochastics are midpoint in the histogram. The MACD is upward trending with the moving averages moving up. The last couple months have not looked bad for a potential covered call range here. We're right at the midpoint, so I would watch out for a return down to the 247, 246. <clears throat> it does like 270. It's going to be a hard area for a cross above. If it does cross above right there, 247, you look at a return right there in the the three standard deviation about the 280s for now. Uh, volatility wise for now, it's relatively high. It looks like it's going to be going into earnings here shortly. Yeah, it looks like earnings are going to be upon us soon. 
So you want to keep that in mind. Does it follow implied volatility waves going into its earnings? Well, you bet it does. Look at that. Look at those very rhythmic upward movements in earnings. Except for this one. This one had a little bit of disruption there near the end of the year. So this is an implied volatility wave stock. So if you're going to be trading the options on it, it doesn't have, give me an earnings date here. Um, it, but it does look like earning days are going to be happening soon just by looking at the implied volatility here. So if you're going to be trading any type of long options on it into its earnings, I would highly recommend against that. Unless you're looking to maybe capture a little bit more of an IV bump. But um, for the most part, it looks like we're, we're forming an IV implied volatility wave. And it looks, looks like we're getting towards the end of the completion of that wave. So I would be very careful any type of long options for any type of swing trades here in now. Next up, let's go take a look at Netflix and then AMD. And I'm sorry I'm going a little bit over in Oh, I'm going way over in time. Sorry, I wanted to break down these stocks a little bit more. So Netflix has earnings next week on the 15th. It's trading in a pretty nice range here between 280 and 262. Uh, I'd either wait for a break above or a break below this range here before I qualify entering a trade in Netflix. Its earnings are going to be make or break earnings this cycle. Why are they make or break? It's because next month we have Apple Plus and Disney Plus coming online. And that's going to be a big competitor to the streaming space. Now Netflix does have original content and like Amazon, they are buying pretty much everything that's in Sundance Film Festival. They're buying it left and right. They try to build a moat to once these streaming services start coming online, that they can start um, having proprietary rights to some type of content. But Apple Plus is going to struggle with that greatly as well. Disney Plus is not going to struggle with that at all. You're talking about close to 100 years of content that Disney has access to pretty much since cartoons and television has started Disney has a lot of rights to that so how do you compete with a company that has that much content you typically see a decline in market share so we're going into earnings that's a red flag for Netflix Netflix is a volatile mover in earnings earnings is in next week you want to be careful Netflix is gonna have to raise their price at some point just because of data flow how many people use their service eventually they're going to have to pay for that data transferring and when you go into a time where disney is at 9.99 and you need to raise your price structure to 14.99 um, and you don't have anywhere near the content as your competitor you're going to see some people starting to decline descriptions there so be very careful here in netflix last up amd amd is a semiconductor today is a trade talk with china united states Risk on. You're going to be very careful with AMD. If you're going to be long in AMD, you're doing so knowing that you're inside a red star event for semiconductors. So AMD is not a trade I'm going to recommend at all. Uh, if you're going to trade it, that's great. Use your own risk profile for that. But AMD is in a, an event that I consider very volatile today. So volatile, in fact, that tomorrow we can see an absolute different chart in AMD than we see today. There's no range in here in AMD that I can recommend that would be safe or where a potential upside could be. Just because the semiconductors are so volatile right now, I would not trade AMD. But again, your risk profile is different than my risk profile. The chart is going to look considerably different potentially going into tomorrow. So be very careful on this one. Be very careful. All right. Whew. With that being said, though, it's been well over an hour here. I'm surprised my voice lasted this long. I'm actually pretty impressed. That's the miracle of antihistamines. With that being said, though, if you've not checked out the university tab in quite some time, there is a wealth inside of knowledge inside of this chart, inside of this web page to you can use to learn and grow in your knowledge in the stock market. I met a couple of you at this meetup last week that were new to the site and want to learn more about options and stock trading 
if that does apply to you or if you're a new member to the site you simply click on this university tab right here and you scroll down and you can learn more about options right here with Micah you can learn more about the stock market with Micah if you're new to want to get better at your price targeting you want to learn Elliott Wave there's an excellent class right here with by Andy the Elliott Wave theory he is in the chat room most days he is an excellent trader with years and years of knowledge ask him as many questions as you like he loves questions and ask the community about your trades the more you ask the better insight you might get into the trades and the better your trading might become also if you're new to the site every Tuesday Nick has a Q&A session where he goes over some of the new parameters of the site and any questions you might have with it and if you want to become a better day trader well here's our day trading class with Swalik he's an excellent day trader he trades every morning right at the market opens Monday through Friday he has a great set of rules as well when it comes to trading I highly recommend his class if you are new to trading in general or if you're a veteran trader and just want to improve your day trading skills Swalik's class is amazing with that being said though this has been your portfolio growth I'm Jake Pelly from Wall Street Hill. have a good rest of your day everyone keep watching the markets if this trade delegation falls apart the markets gonna get very volatile or if the deal is reached the markets gonna get volatile so keep a watch towards the end of the market today it's gonna be pretty interesting with that being said trade safe and I shall see you back in the chat room